the cloud. Okay. Thank you. Thank you Gina, All right. So again, me. this is Nature's Best Hope, bringing environmentally ethical horticult practices to parks and torrents. Um, I love this photo. I just took it today, but it's kind of fun. Um, I'll get to what it is and, and why it's fun in a little bit. About myself, um, I've been outside in nature for the last 55 years. Uh, I love I love nature and it's just, I can remember from the time I could crawl out of bed, I needed to be outside and, and enjoying it. Um, I've taught most sciences in science school and in the classroom, I taught for about 25 years in that way. And then I got the phenomenal job of being at the Madrona Marsh Preserve and Nature Center for 15 years. And that was, it was a dream. It was, it will, at the end of my life, I'm sure that I'll say that was the best job I ever had. It was just, it was a calling and I, and I love, I loved being there. I loved being with the people and being able to walk on the land and, and, just so so many beautiful parts of it. It was wonderful. I've been observing and interacting with nature all over the US, Central America, South America, a little bit in Europe. Um, and a lot of that has uh, informed a lot of uh, the way I interact in the world too. And why? Why is it so interesting to me? It's because nature is such an amazing system. I am I have always been very interested in systems management and I just, I love the way nature as a system works um, and, and sometimes doesn't work. And I, I do that even when I'm teaching in a classroom, I look at the way the system of the kids were working and I'd rearrange the kids in the classroom and, and continue to make it work better. And I, I do that in my garden. Um, so for me, nature is a system that is absolutely incredible. Um, I really pay attention to all aspects of it and, and try to learn as much as I can every day. I'm out in it every single day, but all of it, I'm wondering what's going on here? What is nature really teaching me and, or us? And what, if anything, can I take away from this experience to be a more responsible member of the natural world? So a little bit different as a naturalist, um, a little bit different point of view than a lot of people, um, but I think some people share some of these in, similarly. I love sharing experiences. Um, sharing experiences to me is super important. I love talking to folks about native plants and nature, times with elders that share uh, the same worldview. Uh, Linda, thank you. Um, just so many, so many great walks and, and time out on the land, times with my family and sharing. Tony, uh, you were such a huge, I always call you the plant, native plant guru. Your dedication, devotion to the natural world is, um, yeah, I'm, I've got to be careful, I'll cry. That's how important it is to me. David Moody really introduced me to birds. Uh, I didn't bird until I met David. And I, I learned so much about birding from him and, and fit that into the, to, to the patchwork of nature. I love sharing time with the Nook Magnamana because he's so enthusiastic about birds birding in nature. So I just love sharing the world with him. Beth Shibata, as a photographer, my gosh, to see the world through a lens. She was the one who got me into photography and I really appreciated that. Bob Shanman, such an ardent um, advocate for nature and birds and birding. I just love sharing time with him. Noel Urania is probably the best naturalist I know in the world um, that I personally know. Um, he's uh, in Costa Rica and just an amazing fellow who is um, perpetually learning and sharing about life. Susan Hubert, um, she's the president of the Friends of Madrona Marsh right now. I love sharing time with her because she likes to share life and stories. And um, I really appreciate that. I thought that was really important. I need to add on there, uh, Connie, I, I mentioned you uh, earlier, but in doing the research for this talk, I used so much of Connie's um, information and I, I downloaded some lists that I didn't quite yet have. And I just had a great time with uh, nature, Mother Nature's Backyard uh, blog. So. Take a look at that if you get a chance. Um, young students, uh, really young students really see the world differently than most of us do. And I love seeing that. The land stewards of Madrona, uh, that includes all the volunteers and the people who had keys um, because they cared so much without, without question. Uh, I, I really appreciate the shared experiences that I've had with life everywhere and anywhere. And from each of these folks and land forms or life forms, they inform the way I see the world and interact with the world. If you take a minute now, think about and appreciate those people who informed your worldview. All of us have had that time. Uh, 
of course, I do a lot of reading um, uh, every day. I, I'm doing reading, and this was this book, um, "Bringing Nature Home," was introduced to me by another friend of mine, Lisa Fimiani, over at at Bayona Wetlands, and it was really, really important because it was the first book that I had read that really talked about and supported the losses of biodiversity in our life supporting systems, and I I was really I started. Uh, changing the way I do my own garden, my own personal garden because of this book, and really started looking at my yard as a place where biodiversity needed to be paramount in the garden design. And so that led me into this one. Uh, this is uh, Douglas Tallamy's latest book, uh, Nature's Best Hope, A New Approach for Conservation That Starts in Your Yard. When I read this, I read it three times after that, and um, I knew it was spot on. It was just, it was such an amazing, it's such an amazing book. And I'm gonna give you a little summary of it and how it goes into how it relates to Torrance Parks uh, throughout this slideshow. In the coming 20 or so slides, you're gonna see them that they're dark uh, slides. I pirated those slides right off the internet doing screen grabs. So I wanna give Doug Tallamy <laughs> the credit where credit is due um, and, uh, and he has, he's amazing, he's very amazing. In summary, his book talked about food production now claims half of the land's earth surface. Homes take up the other, other half. In total, um, less than 5% of the earth is in the state uh, that has been non-disturbed by humans. Less than 5%, that's an amazing amount. We all know the red flags, they're well known. We know about the plight of bees and monarchs and the native bees are also uh, in peril too. 50% of the Midwestern native bee species have disappeared from their historic range in the last century. Four bumblebee species have declined 96% in 20 years. 20 years, that's not very much time. Three bumble species may already be extinct, they haven't been seen. And 25% of our bumblebee species are at risk of extinction. 432 species of North American birds are threatened with extinction. Three billion fewer breeding birds today than 40 years ago. Now in, in uh, doing the research for this, Ptolemy had on one of his um, presentations, he said it's really hard to get a, an idea of what a billion is. Three billion is, is, is even more ridiculous. But if you think of um, a million at a million, as about 35, 36 minutes, then 3 billion would be 32 years. That's how much is gone already. So that's a really huge uh, amount uh, that's a threatened. This loss is really all about insects. There's a lot of research out there. This is Rosenberg's research in 2009, looked at bird species that had insects as their essential diet, in their essential diet, and insects not as essential in their diet. If you look over here on the right hand side, you'll see insects that were not essential in the diet. Then these species, if this is baseline, they're actually expanded a smidge. But those species, 304 species, the insects were insects were essential in their diet. They've lost 10, the number in 10 billion, in 10 million birds were lost. That's how important species are to birds. And it's a worldwide problem. Um, there's lots of examples of worldwide problems, but this one's really stuck in my head. Both the house sparrow and the starling are now red listed in England. Those are weed birds and they are red listed in England. That's how much habitat destruction there has been there. You see interesting and terrifying um, really uh, Headlines, one million species face extinction, according to the UN. That's a lot of species. What does that mean? And why does it matter? You know, does it really matter? The creatures that keep us alive are disappearing. Now, if I were to stop the slideshow right here, you would say, well, okay, it's a pretty big problem. But really, that moth that you were showing, does that really matter? Let's talk about that. How important are insects to birds? Birds eat 500 million tons of insects each year. What happens when there are, not, there are fewer and fewer insects? That's why we're seeing these bird declines. Did you see all those caterpillars? I mean, gee. Just amazing amount of, of uh, insects that are consumed. 
when you look at the biomass that is producing those insects, the native insects versus the invasive insects or non-native, if this is the full, in, the full uh, biomass here, when you have invasive species, it's reduced by 96%. The biomass is reduced by 96%. Let's say you had, look at it in an economic terms because people that we talk about native plants to um, don't really get native plants until you talk about it in an economic term. If you had a hundred dollars and all of a sudden you had invasives come into your bank account and you lost 96% of it, you'd only have a few dollars left. So that's a pretty big significant loss. People would really start to be concerned if they look at it in, in terms of dollars. It impacts more than half of all breeding North American bird species. 386 neotropical migrants no longer have enough insects to justify migration. Don't worry, the story's gonna get better at the end. Don't get discouraged, okay? Also, let's not forget about residential birds uh, that need to nest uh, to rear their young. If you think about the chickadees up in the mountains, one clutch of chickadees that those parents must catch about between 6,000 and 9,000 caterpillars just to raise one clutch to get them out of the nest. And then for another 21 days, they, read, they, raise, they raise their children, they feed their children insects. So they're really actually catching over 15,000 insects to raise one clutch. So how, how, do, we, how do we deal with this? How, how is it that we can deal with something? Well, you start looking at solutions, right? You look at, okay, 85.6% of the land east of just the Mississippi is privately, privately owned. So doesn't that tell you that maybe privately owned might be a solution? The first thing, of course, we can do is to start saving insects at home. And you guys all know about the importance of reduction of lawn, but this is a very typical way that people still manage their yards. What is it that happens in those yards? What causes this insect decline? Pesticides are huge, especially uh, throughout the country, in the middle part of the country. Habitat loss, huge. Non-native ornamentals, huge. Invasive species, huge. Light pollution has become a major contributor to death of insects and climate change. What's really great about this slide, this is, it isn't, this is a hopeful slide because five of those six things we can do at home, make a difference at home, we can stop using pesticides, we can create habitat, we can take out our non-natives, we can um, remove invasive species, we can change to yellow LED bulbs. And climate change, actually there's a solution for that too. I, I have been working with the folks at the James Ranch in Durango, uh, Colorado. It's a completely sustainable ranch permaculture orchards, it orchard there, the entire ranch runs with no chemicals. That's no fertilizers, no pesticides. And they have all the beef, all the fruits, all the vegetables, everything, honey, everything that you can imagine, no chemicals. So that even climate change, if we change the way we do farming and ranching, even that would help. We must in fact raise the bar for what we ask our landscapes to do. In the past, and I am part of this past, by the way, past criteria for choosing plants for our landscapes, we wanted decorative value, we wanted screens, we want a focal point, we want anchor plants. That's what we wanted, but it tilts the, the balance all the way over away from what could be potentially environmentally friendly. So if we do put in natives, then we can have food supplies. We can protect our watersheds from the, the chemicals that are used. We can store carbon. We can restore soil, moderate weather, create pollinator habitat, human health, support natural enemies, and have wildlife appreciation just by choosing the plants for our landscape that are functional. If we add function to the criteria used to select plants and landscaping, it would equal Eco ecosystem restoration everywhere you do it. We cannot restore ecosystems without restoring insect population. This bluebird depends upon it. But which insects should we make room for? What, how do we choose what's the most important? 
There are a lot of insects in the world to choose from. There are three to four million insects worldwide and 164,000 species in the US alone. And that's the named ones. There's na unnamed ones that people discover every day. Turns out that there's two most important insect groups. Number one, insects that maintain plant diversity. And the uh, second is insects that contribute the most energy to food, food webs. And we'll get into these here in just a moment. These two are pollinators and caterpillars. Pollinators, we knew that. Caterpillars, really? How many of you think back and thought, oh, caterpillar, they're ruining my... They turn out to be very, very important. Let's start with pollinators. I love these metallic sweat bees. Why do we need them? Well, we've been told uh, that bees pollinate about a third of our crops. Turns out that that actually isn't true. That's a nice little television piece that is, a, well, it's from our fake news world. It turns out that actually it's about one twelfth of our crops are uh, pollinated by these European honeybees. The rest are pollinated by other pollinators, native pollinators too. 80% of all plants and 90% of all angiosperms are pollinated by animals. And by animals, I mean insects. Losing our pollinators is not an option. Let's look at that again. 80% of all plants and 90% of, of all angiosperms are pollinated by insects. What happens if we don't have insects? What happens if we lose 80% of all of our plants? We're not talking about good land stewardship here. We are talking about essential land stewardship. Most insects that visit flowers are not pollinators. They're flower visitors. This is a hard one for people to get across. They think that if they see insects in their yard or they see things buzzing around, then, oh, goody, we've got pollinators. But that's not, in fact, true. It's not that they don't serve a purpose, but that is not true. Who are our major pollinators? Number one species, honeybee, introduced. 4,000 species of native bees and 14,000 species of moths and butterflies. Those are tremendous numbers of pollinators. What is a bee? 90% of our native bees are solitary and not aggressive. The most aggressive bee on the planet is our honeybee. Uh, the European honeybee. And it is very interesting that most people are afraid of bees, even if they're native. So it takes a little bit of education to tell people that a bee is a pollinator that's essential. All bees. Where do bees nest? A lot of people are starting to get into understanding bees. Well, most are ground nester, some nesters, some are woody stem nesters, and some are pithy stem nesters. I can't help to think of another uh, person who has just been very instrumental in my understanding of bees, and that's Jean Bellaman uh, with her bee houses. 70% of our native bees are ground nesters. And this is basically, they basically make a single hole in some sandy loam. There may be three or four holes uh, together, but it's still only one bee. So it's really neat to have some sandy loam or some soil that's open in your garden so that you can have ground nesting bees. I am just starting uh, to get ground nesting bees for the season now. I have little small, uh, about half centimeter holes in my garden now. I love seeing those. Pithy and woody stem nesters. A lot of people have, are starting to see these. Basically a bee lays an egg in a stem and it will fill it with pollen. And then the bee larva eats up the pollen and then will emerge. So this is the first one that was laid. It's a little bit larger. And the second egg that was laid a little bit larger, uh, smaller. And then this is the little baby one. So they each of them have their own individual cell in which to grow up and they have their own individual food source. These are really important um, food sources for our native bees. So one of the things that a lot of people ask me, especially at Madrona, when is it a good time to mow down the, the prairie? The actual and true answer to that, and the one that nobody really wants to hear, especially the fire marshal, is that never is a good time. And if you do have to mow it, you would only mow about a third of it at a time. Try to leave as much as you can and only take a third off the top. So keeping it low, keeping it high rather. 
there's lots of ways to create native uh, habitat for stem nesting bees. And basically this is a really nice um, chart on how to deal with it. You've got your plant that's dormant in winter and it's in uh, spring. You wanna lead the, leave the dead flower stalks intact all winter. Okay, then in spring, you wanna cut it halfway back because there's gonna be some bees in, the, in here. And then in the summer when it grows again, you're gonna have these that are gonna be in there and they will cover up the old growth. And then in the winter time, again, you will end up taking the uh, tops off. And pretty soon in the spring, you have all of these bees that are coming, up, coming out. So it's really important not to cut those pithy stemmed plants. And I'll talk about a little bit more about what those are. Um, it's really important not to cut those all the way down to the ground. We've been taught that uh, to cut them down to the ground, but you don't have to. Another, this is another really good way if you don't have a bee house is if you just take some of those pithy stems and you cut them, just tie them together with a single string here and lay them in your wood pile. And then you can see that these three have already been started to be occupied. Bee, bee hotels um, are not the great idea that they were thought to be if they are all close together because a single predator can wipe out entire colony. It's better to put them throughout your yard um, wherever you have bees, small ones. Some of the best genera for bee species, well, sunflowers are terrific um, for both the, the uh, stems and the flowers. Asters, uh, saladagos, uh, golden tops, goldenrod, willows are tremendous. Primrose, indigo, black eyed susan, fleabane, and violets. So those are really good bee, uh, bee specialist plants. Hopefully you have some in your yard. Let's move on a little bit now to caterpillars. They're the bread and butter of the terrestrial food webs. These are the most important animals in our food web because they feed on plants. Plants, as you know, make sugar through photosynthesis and carbohydrates. If a plant is not eaten, then all of that food stays in the plant. It doesn't get into the world. So all of these caterpillars, these moth caterpillars are eating and somebody's going to eat them. So that then starts the food web, mo uh, moving energy through the system. Cal caterpillars transform more, more energy from plants than any other animal or any other insect. Most plants don't like to, to uh, have caterpillars around. I love elderberry trees. This is an elderberry. It's set up completely perfectly. It does not host any caterpillars. However, it's a terrific uh, plant, habitat plant for fall berries and also for pollinators in the spring. It just will, most plants don't want to have any caterpillars on them. So they set themselves up chemically to not accept caterpillars. There's just a few. Oaks are the keystone. They are absolutely a keystone. Um, they're a keystone uh, plant. 5% of our native plants make 75% of the food that drives our food webs. 5% of our native plants and oaks are the most important. Oaks support 557 species of caterpillars in the mid-Atlantic and over 950 species nationwide. Oak trees. Keystone species. Um, this is a really good resource. I've got a whole bunch of resources that I could share with you, but this one is another one, uh, the Native Plant Finder. Cowscapes is another one. Mother Nature's Backyard. If you go into Mother Nature's Backyard blog um, from 2012 to 2019, Connie has put in lists for, um, there's a caterpillar list in there that's nine pages long that you can uh, choose from, especially in Southern California here to have caterpillars. But number one, native oaks, native cherries, native willows. If you go to the store and you ask for an oak tree, you may get an English oak. You may get a flowering cherry. You may get a Chinese willow or, uh, um, you know, non-native species. So it's really important to get what's native in your area. From these two books, the number one thing I learned was insects are not optional. It's not okay if they disappear. They are the primary drivers of our ecosystems. If they go, we go. After reading this book, I had to survey my own yard. I found that I had a lot of insects. So I live here, uh, upper right-hand corner here. I have a standard lot, 50 by 100. 
Um, this, all this area was lawn. This entire front area was lawn. This entire area was lawn. And I took out all of this, all of this back here. And I left a little tiny bit here for family to play on. This is my front yard. Uh, this is that, this was all lawn. Um, lots of natives in here, lots of natives in here, some non-natives. And this is my backyard. Same thing, some natives, some non-natives. So I saw Katie did. Now in two days, in the last two days, I decided, okay, I'm gonna just see what I can find in my yard. I'm gonna spend it. I spent a total of about two and a half hours um, looking for what's in the yard or paying attention to what's in the yard and made photos and spent another hour processing the photos. So I found Katie Dids in the yard. I found all sorts of bugs. So we've got milkweed bugs and green stink bug larva. And I forgot the name of this guy. This is, these are assassin bug, this guy larva, lots of uh, milkweed bugs. Lots of beetles. Um, I have several species of lady ladybugs, and um, I didn't get a convergent in here, but Asian. Uh, this is the Western. Uh, this is a no spotted um, ladybug, and this is a carpet beetle. I ha would say that this time of year, um, the yard is dominated by flies. It's a little grass fly. Unfortunately, I have white flies and cluster flies, and. This is a um, calligra uh, margin calligrapher, bottle fly. This is my first ever soldier fly. I look at these eyes, this is absolutely incredible. And then it's a green bottle fly. I have lots of wasps in there. This is an ichneumon wasp. This is a holly leaf. Okay, this is how small it is. And there it is right there. Lots of uh, different types of wasps. And it's another ichneumon wasp. Lots of aphids and the requisite caterpillar, uh, caterpillar for the ladybug, ladybug larva. It's an Asian one, but really, I have very interesting um, aphids. I have milkweed aphids too, the yellow ones, but I didn't photograph them here. Lots of butterflies. Um, morning cloaks are coming out right now. Red admiral, fiery skippers, monarchs. I also saw marine blues, cabbage whites, uh, hair streak. You know, lots of things uh, coming to the yard, loving the flowers. And also lots of moths. I didn't photograph um, at all last night or the night before. I just caught one this morning. This is a, a somber uh, moth. These are, this is a uh, mint moth and a, uh, this is not a, a pyrusta moth. And then of course bees, the honeybee. Um, it's a little native bee. I don't know what it is and I don't know what this one is either. But there were, there were so many bees that, I, that were moving so fast. It was so warm. I was unable to photograph them. Lots of spiders um, all throughout the yard. I can see webbing for funnel spiders. Uh, this is a wall spider, this is a funnel spider. Uh, this is a funnel spider also. This is a little Phidippus of some sort. These both are bold jumping spiders. This one ate a lynx spider. And this is a sack spider. I actually watched this guy do it very stealth. He walked by, she walked by the spider and then turned around and grabbed it. It was kind of funny uh, the way he did that. And of course, I've got caterpillars, um, moths and butterflies, cabbage white, and, and a lot of micro moth uh, type uh, caterpillars and a lot of, um, of the, the purple moth types. And of course, you can't be in the yard without noticing the birds. Had white eyes come to the bird and hummingbirds come to the yard, uh, doves, lesser goldfinch, this is a, a black Phoebe. This is an interesting relationship. These two folks grew up on a nest uh, in a nearby nest and they have grown up, these, uh, these gals have grown up as friends. So they always come to the feeder. This is an Anna's and an Allen's. It's not generally happening. The Allen's usually run the um, Anna's out of the yard, but uh, in this case, these two are friends and they're never one without the other for the last four or five months now. More birds, uh, these are all born here. Uh, this is a little baby finch, a baby mockingbird, a baby jay. This is a baby oriole. I thought this was funny. Dad came and said, what? You want me to feed you? You're not, not an oriole. There's mom. And of course, uh, mammals. No, they're, they're, they're ubiquitous, so I have to put them in there. This is the mama squirrel she clutched, and this is one of her children um, eating a pomegranate out of my tree. And then things I've never seen before. Every time I go out, I, I see things I've never seen before. This is a yellow collared mask bee. I've never seen it before. 
I posted it on iNaturalist and it immediately got several responses. This is an unpublished, undocumented bee in LA County. Um, it's a native uh, from, it's a native from Australia. Pretty cool looking bee. And then this is encrypted wa uh, wasp. I'd never seen this before. It looks like a fly. Look at these huge antennas, red, very cool uh, wings. But every single time I'm outside, I see something new. It's really amazing. The most productive plants in my yard are my buckwheats, my verbena, and my uh, abutilon palmeri. This is a, uh, a native bee with a European honeybee, so you can see the, the size. So with this information, what can I do with the parks in Torrance? Well, it's hard to make a cultural change anywhere. And so you have to kind of step into it really slowly. So the first thing that I did was I put these plants, I got these plants out in front of City Hall. Uh, there's some natives and some lantana and, and non-natives just to get people used to the idea of a little bit of a different type of landscape. These were all Raphaelepsis indicas in here and Phytosporums on the other side. So there, there was just literally no value. Now, every time you come here, you see butterflies and insects. I, in the front of the city yard and within the city yard, I have been putting in, we have been putting in native plants. Um, the first day that this was put in on this wall, I had a black Phoebe and a Sage Phoebe, Phoebe, first ever Sage Phoebe at the city yard. We're starting to have bluebirds and swallows there now. Now behind the city hall, these are not native plants and at the attic, I just wanted people, these were places where ivy or raphiolepsis, and I wanted people to just see what plants look like to get them used to it. I ended up getting some violets in there, but I don't have any natives in here yet. So I'm just allowing them, uh, the people, particularly the city council people that enter this doorway to see something other than what they're used to seeing. So I'm just gently getting folks used to a different type of landscape. Whoop, you don't need to see that one. Then we went over to Torrance Park, this huge area right here looked like this, all boxwood, uh, Myrtus compacta. And so we started putting in both natives and non-natives in here, some roses, because it was requested. So that, that went relatively well. Um, and so we continued on. We went over to Seaside Heroes Park and put in a whole bunch of native plants in here. Um, and it's along the pathway and on both entrances. So that's doing very well. We have a wonderful Adopt-A-Park group uh, that works at this park uh, with Jenna Christensen and uh, helps to take care of this park and, and keep it uh, trimmed and neat. Then we went over to Greenwood School. Uh, we had a request to, to go over there and add there. Now this area, it's grass. And you're saying, well, Tracy, why did you put in grass? Well, this is a, these are kindergartners and this was sand and it was a cat box. And so this is an appropriate use of grass. This, this is a good place for the kids to play because the entire rest of the area is concrete. Now we said, if we're gonna do this, we, you must put in, we must put in a native garden. And that's what we've done here. We've got vegetables and natives growing in here, which is right along, this is the area over here where the grass is. So we added that. Then at Hickory Park, this was, is a garden bed now. It's got natives in it. The other thing that's really super important is when we are putting in new trees now, we're either mulching around there or we're putting flowers or understory around new trees. And the reason is because the caterpillars up in the trees that are feeding on the trees, they usually drop down and pupate in the soil, but there's no evidence that they actually make it through the grass to have uh, to, to emerge, emerge out. They fall to the ground and die. So this, this provides that opportunity. And then this is the big, big project that we're doing now. This is the first park uh, that we're taking on. It's, it's based on the E.O. Wilson's half earth um, idea. E.O. Wilson is the best naturalist of our time, living naturalist of our time. He's an entomologist and he basically wrote the book called uh, Half Earth. And in the premise of that is we must, in order to survive, we must have half of the planet for the animals and plants and half for us. And so we took out half of the non-native species here and at Discovery Park here, a little pocket park in South Torrance. And we are going to completely replant it with a sustainable landscape. 
this grass is even go, going out. This will be going out too. Um, so that it'll be the first park in Torrance that's like that. According to Ptolemy, these are the nine things you can do to restore the ecosystem in your yard. Number one, cut your lawn in half. Number two, plant for specialist bees. Number three, remove the invasive species from your property. Number four, use those keystone plants, those very specific ones for bees and caterpillars and pollinators. Landscape for caterpillars, reduce your light uh, pollution. This is a really big one. Thousands and thousands of insects die every year just because our, of our back porch light. It should be on a motion sensor or it should be yellow LED, that would help. Oppose mosquito spraying. The mosquito spraying is a huge problem um, throughout the US um, because it's non-specific. It kills anything it con comes into contact with. And then minimize insecticide use. Really the only thing that uh, we need to actually manage to use an insecticide for is termites. The rest is manageable in another way. Mosquitoes are the ones that people argue about a little bit, but you can manage the mosquitoes in your yard by putting a bucket, like a five gallon bucket of water in your yard. Go ahead and let the mosquitoes lay in there. They're gonna die after they lay their eggs. And then um, you just put some BTI or some uh, mosquito dunks in there and you can manage the mosquitoes in your yard. And then if you are part of an HOA, join it so that you can make change of landscape from within the system. In summary, nature's best, best hope, it, I thought it was really great news that it was on, that it's now considered a New York Times bestseller. Landscape for function, considering the little things that run the world, according to E.O. Wilson. We need to stop segregating ourselves from nature because we are part of nature and we need to teach people about that. It starts with the plants. They are the drivers of all ecosystems. They take the sun and produce carbohydrates and simple sugar and push that through the web. Not all plants are caterpillar friendly. We need to select for these. Climate change is too big to tackle alone. Um, everybody thinks about climate change. We're aware about it, but it just feels like it's too big of a problem. Yes, if you put solar panels on your house, that's really great, but you don't see an immediate change. If you put one oak tree, you will see the benefits almost immediately. You will have insects to that oak tree immediately or any native plants, uh, buckwheats in particular in our area. Plantings do not have to be wild and messy. They can be everywhere, including in urban places like parks. And concrete uh, is one of the things I'm fighting in Torrance because that seems to be the most convenient solution to land, um, but it's an ecological disaster. Much like lawns, they ruin watersheds and provide no ecological benefits and also harm weather. In, in continuing, um, are we heading toward an age of ecological enlightenment? To me, it seems so. The, the kids that I talk to, the students that I work with, and the adults that are like us, that are, that are so passionate about native plants, it seems that we're making a difference. Effective conservation is at the hands of the, if, if we put in these plants, if we do native plant gardens and in public places, then the hands, the, it's in the hands of individuals. There are not enough conservationists to start this movement alone. The, the problems are solvable if we take gardens and we take public lands. Imagine American Honda with no grass and just plants there on, on Torrance Boulevard. Imagine all of these huge places that have grass and change them. We can make a difference and one person can, can make a difference. Nature's best hope is us. Thank you. Well, thanks a lot, Tracy. Mm -hmm. Hold on. Got to echo. I really want to say thank you to all the folks that have inspired me. And, and I know that this is a talk that a lot of you guys know a lot about. Um, but I just really want to, there's so many people that are on this, on this group of, of people that have been really, really out there doing the work. And I really appreciate that. Okay. Anyway, I think I got Maybe I did. Hopefully I did. Um, sorry, my computer's doing funny things here. There we go. That's better. If anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Hey, Tracy, Rob, Sharon. Um, hi. Hi. 
you know, you're, you're saying thank you to all those people. And I, I think all of us people here need to say a big thank you to you and for what you have done um, for, for the city of Torrance, for the, the Madrona Marsh and for our lives too. I mean, I don't know how many of us are converts from grass and stuff, but you had a big, a big influence on Sharon and I, along with Connie, Connie Vanheim. Yeah, Connie. Um, Tony Baker. Tony Baker. Tony Baker. Yeah. You know, it's just amazing what we've learned over the past years and what we've accomplished, you know, and, and I, I was reminiscing back when you were talking about having people um, learn about this and everything. When we were in the Master Composter pro program with the University of California Extension Services, we went around and would talk to anybody about composting. And, and, you know, they'd say, oh, what's that stuff on your lawn? Oh, it's compost. This is how we make it. This is how we do it. And we do the same thing now that's been inbred in us. And, uh, you know, somebody's walking along and Sharon's out in front pulling weeds and they'll stop and they'll talk and Sharon starts talking about, you know, native plants. So it's, it's great. It's Way really great, a great trip. And hopefully we can keep the train going. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. Well, Robin, Sharon, thank you. Great to see you too. It's been a long time. <laughs> It has been. Good to see you. Good to see you. Well, there was a question from Adela in the chat. Let me see if I could find it. Um, I've got Adele's. Uh, do wasps and Argentine ants have a function in the garden? because they're killing my monarch butterflies. Um, wasps are a really big problem and I actually do have uh, the European paper wasps uh, removed um, because they are a problem, especially to monarch butterflies. Uh, I have, um, uh, Wendy um, does my bee removal in, in, at, in Torrance and she's been very, very good um, at that. Argentine ants, I don't have personal experience with them because I don't have any Argentine ants in my yard. and. Um, I, I managed to be able to uh, get a hold of those probably the first year I moved into the house. Um, so I don't really, I don't have experience with that one, but I, I know they're removable as well. Um, Carol asks, what is Torrance planning to do to maintain the gardens? Long Beach has put a native in some parks and they walked away and failed. That's a really, really big uh, problem in a lot of places that do restoration. However, I'm building a sustainability team. Um, I have reorganized the way Torrance does parks. We have a landscape team um, that does all landscapes, including tree trimming. And then I have a maintenance team that does uh, just uh, the bathrooms, picks up all the debris and trash, does the paths, picnic areas, um, all of the barbecues, all of that kind of stuff. And then I have another team that just does mowing and construction. So we actually have a third of our staff that is dedicated to landscape management. And um, that was a really hard, it took me three years to put that one into place because there was such pushback for that, but it's working. And so each one of our landscapes are continuing to be maintained. Was there, a, uh, was there an economic benefit that you were able to uh, convince the uh, city of in terms of having that structure? No, um, I didn't do it economically. Um, uh, yes, the water savings, but I couldn't because our irrigation, we have so much grass in Torrance. We've got 300 acres, 380 some acres of, of uh, land out there in parks. Uh, about 200 of that is grass and about 100% of it has water leaks. Um, I'm, I'm fighting a 50 to 60 year old water systems in most of the parks. So I couldn't make a reasonable and honest argument about water savings. Um, but I could, I made it as a potential. I couldn't speak to it directly. Economically, uh, no, I, I did not. Um, I have not yet talked about the economic benefits. However, part of this, uh, the nature's best hope and and the, the movement that is going on, we plan on taking to the Environmental Commission, the Recreation Commission, the City Council, and the City Manager's Office to continue this process. Good question. Try to see if I could jump in, I have another one. Do you have um, any idea of how many people, or first of all, has the city received any comments from people saying, oh, we like the new plantings, or oh, we don't like the new plantings, and two, have you had any personal observations of people just kind of walking along and all of a sudden stopping and looking? 
Yes, um, I, I totally, I've had one negative comment for the fruit trees over at Lago Seco Park. We put in 22 fruit trees mm -hmm. and it's uh, fallen fruit. It's a public orchard. People can uh, pick that fruit for free. Um, however, the biggest thing that's happened is um, our adopt a park program is just exploding. We have seven groups that are doing adopt a parks because they really like what they're seeing and they want to participate. And I see that as the solution to the economic crisis we're in post COVID with all of the budget cuts. So I'm really encouraged. That's why that one slide, are we at, on the precipice? Are we just beginning into an ecological enlightenment period? I believe so. And these, these are kids, these are young kids. My oldest volunteer is 72, um, who's working on the Hickory Garden. So yeah, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, I think if you could sell it, if you will, as a, a uh, recreational opportunity, you know, um, that you know, the, the, adopt, the adopt a parks program, um, I think that would go a long ways. I know people, I often hear people say to me, well, you only care about plants, you don't care about people. Well, the plants are good for people. We need them as you, as you, your talk essentially was all about that, you know, as people, we need these things. It's, it's not a matter of they're, they're, you know, pretty things to look at only, but they're, they're necessities that we need for life. And uh, I think, you know, having the city be aware of the recreational, loosely put opportunity uh, of, having these at the parks is very helpful. I think that's really super important. I'm just now redoing the Adopt-a-Park brochure and I will absolutely put that in there. Thank you so much, David. Hi, Al. Hi. Do I get to talk? Ah, yes, hi. Yes, please. Um, <laughs> hi, Tracy, it's wonderful hi. to see you. Um, one, minute, one person asked about the um, Argentine ants. Yes. And we noticed in our yard, we've been here over 20 years and started planting natives the first year, basically. The main place that I see ants is around our fence because our neighbors irrigate all the time. And they also use pesticides all the time, or they did. Uh, but we hardly ever have any Argentine ants in on the rest of the yard at all. So I think they like the water. And I think that you have to kind of rethink your, your irrigation practices so you don't use a lot. We hardly ever water our garden. So I, I had a couple of questions. Number one, did I hear you talk about a problem with paper wasps? Are they non-native? The, uh, there is the European paper wasp is, that's uh, the most common one that we get under our eaves. Um, yeah. And they, they, they kill uh, the monarch caterpillars. And so I have them removed. They're also aggressive. Um, if you run into them, they will actually run and bite you and they, or sting you and they can sting you multiple times. And mm -hmm. I, I'm hurting, it hurts my head. I had one attack me uh, last year and that's when I was done. I had Wendy's brother come out and take my, high, my mm -hmm. nest out. We also have some large um, red, red orange wasps. wasps about Those are native. Long. Okay. Those are native. They, they burrow, and yeah, yeah. you know we have at least half a dozen burrows. Awesome, yeah. good. Yeah, they like the Ariognum. Yep, the buckwheat. Yep, yep, very much so. So um, there's a question in the chat from Kathy. You mentioned places like American Honda. Uh, they are very open to contributing to community well-being. Suggestions for helping them uh, convert to green lawn need help. If they, yeah, if anybody, I was working with American Honda on another um, project that they were doing, but anytime that they're, whenever they're ready to do that, um, I'm sure they'll reach out to us, I mean, or to you guys uh, for help with that, because there's a, there's a gigantic opportunity right there. It'd be fantastic to see that. Okay. Well, if anybody from Honda is listening, uh, you know, that's uh, or if one you know way, anybody. That, that's way one, one way that the SoCal helpful Honda people could be helpful, so to speak. Yep. All right, let's see if there's any other questions. Let's see. Um, oh, Rosalie says, how do you train your landscapers on native plant maintenance? Yeah, this is a huge, huge problem. It is. Um, I, I started with only two people and I put, I put one uh, supervisor and one lead maintenance worker 
in the landscape crew that I knew were native plant people, or at least horticulturalists, or at least cared about plants and not the task of mobile and going. So, um, and then I would pair one person with each of them for about a year or a year and a half. So like the Torrance Park Garden, I would say if I had to give it a letter grade, it's about a C minus because it was our first one that was in and it was the very beginning of the process and our maintainers didn't know it very well. And so they, they just didn't know it. But now I've got like eight people that have worked individually and now they're starting to pair up and really care. They, they can weed, they understand about the, the, um, the soil, they understand about the seeds, they understand about bulbs we've put in there. Thank you, Tony, for that. You know, so I'm starting to get an educated workforce, but it's super slow and super hard. Oh, um, somebody asked, um, thank you for your work. It's from Gordon. Are you familiar with the Long Beach Parking Strip Program? Uh, what are the chances that Tarns will start a similar program, uh, especially when re removing street trees? Um, uh, what can we do to get native street trees when old ones are removed? Good question. Yeah. <laughs> okay, that, um, your answer said it all. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was, uh, okay. Okay, so the, uh, the parking stick uh, strip program, it isn't, um, I've been really trying very hard to move towards uh, native trees. The native, the, the uh, park services runs parks and um, public works runs street trees. And I will have to say though, I love our, our fellow who's our, our arborist and who ran, runs the street tree program. Uh, they're not, they're not ready uh, yet for native trees. They put in a tremendous number of crepe myrtles and uh, liquid ambers and, and things like that that are easy to maintain, that stay small and things like that. So we're, we're not ready for street trees yet. I, I gotta get into the parks. I'm only controlling, I'm only in control of the parks at this point. Uh, but street trees hold, liability on trees is one of the things that makes me uh, stay awake at night. We have eucalyptus trees in a lot of parks. They scare the hell out of me um, because they of the limb drop that they do this time of year. So um, I, I just, I really, really try to work with Lewis and I try to work with my staff to put in tree, trees that are habitat friendly. I have put in the first Engelman Oh no, there's what there was in the 34 parks, there's only one Engelman Oak and we're putting in Oaks now, uh, live Oaks and Engelman Oaks uh, and they're doing really well. So um, it's, it, again, these changes are slow. It's a cultural shift, but, uh, but we are being able to make them. I think it's important to, um, you know, to do small steps like you were saying, you know, I'm not, I think one of the mistakes people make when they landscape a garden in the first place, like Abalone Cove, for instance, mm -hmm. um, they want it to look, you know, like a fully developed garden on the first day it opens, uh, and then there's no room for it to grow in. But I think that, so that's one problem. But on a more important note, people, it's hard for people to change even when things change for the better. And so by doing it gradually, I think it's a lot easier on most people. So I think, you know, your the work you did at Madrona, people are seeing it pay off and you have that to show off. Now, you know, you're in the parks and so we'll start seeing that, you know, people getting more familiar with it in the parks as more people get involved with adopt a park and just going to the park and seeing how, you know, the benefits of the natives, then eventually they'll be ready for, you know, to convert their lawns and and uh, and American Honda will 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 see the light. Yeah, one of the big things, um, one of the most important things that we've done that's differently. We got a three point eight million dollar grant to do the basins, uh, three of the basins in Torrance. We're working on another basin, and we're putting in sustainable landscapes there, and they're working Henrietta, Amy, and Intradero. Um, one of the most important things that we did that is a change is we put into the grant three years of maintenance. One of, uh, I think about Travis Longcore and Rudy Matoni and the Bluffs projects and the, the uh, 
all of the projects that were done you know, pretty much in the early 2000s and in the 90s, many of those failed because they didn't have any funding for maintenance whatsoever. And frankly, maintenance wasn't allowed in, in grants anymore. But I believe that we changed the landscape by pushing the Conservancy who uh, and the Natural Resources Agency who supply funding for most of these types of projects to say, listen, we need three years of restoration, irrigation, and maintenance. Uh, restoration being plant replacement irrigation mean meaning over the top drip or some form of irrigation for the first three years um, that can be removed and then of course the the weeding uh, that needs to be done in the processing processes so we are really um, a lot of that knowledge to, uh, Tony's kind of an expert at, at when he put in the garden in the areas that he manages at Madrona just seeing how important that those areas are uh, to, to make sure you have maintenance sustainable maintenance practices. Yeah. So uh, there was a question in the chat, I think, that we missed from um, Linda, which actually directed to, to me. Um, does Tracy have irrigation to get the plants established in the various parks where she's introduced them? So I think you just answered that question. But people ask me all the time on the Land Conservancy walks or just other places, well, I thought there are native plants and they don't need any irrigation. Um, and so the answer to that is um, that, you know, many of these plants would take uh, literally a thousand years before the conditions were just right for them to germinate and, and to grow and, and to get established. And, and we don't have that kind of time. And so we, we, we need to help them to, to get established. Um, and then once they're established, then many of them uh, can survive without any added water or, or just occasional water and, and look good. Um, so um, I think uh, irrigation is still important, but the thing that people have to understand is that um, with native plants, the amount of irrigation you need is significantly less uh, uh, than it would be with, with many of the introduced species, particularly you know, European English <laughs> species and things like that. But did you want to add anything else? That's so true. That's very, very true. It's I finding I'm finding it's about eighty to ninety percent less water is needed uh, once the plants are established. Tracy, yes, hey, this is Sharon and Rob again. Um, what what is an update on the uh, Walnut Street basin? Uh, that is running. It's up and running. Um, all of the water was diverted in that neighborhood to drain into the Walnut Basin. Um, we put in a phenocam. Uh, I get the results from the phenocam so that I can see what's going on there at any given time. And I'm supposed to monitor that for about a year. Uh, if we ever get rain again, um, it will inform where we do our restoration because I don't know what the flood zone is. It's been a little over 100 years since... Uh, that basin actually received full flood water. So um, I the, the soil is conducive for a really good um, a really good restoration there. However, I'm just not sure exactly what's going to happen. We did get approximately four inches of rain at the bottom, four inches of puddling at the bottom, a good little beginning of a vernal pool area, but we just didn't get rain enough this year uh, to measure anything. So I have to wait till the next season. Need a lot of patience in doing that form of restoration. Have you been successful uh, getting rid of those who like to hang out there and aren't supposed to be there? Mostly, yes. Um, activity, uh, we, we have found in, in parks and in um, basins and things like that, activity has a tendency to scoop people away. Um, we do have a little bit of problems still from the apartments there on the south side uh with uh, with drug use and and needles and stuff that come flying over the wall so we do have a land steward uh working in that basin and we have it all get it picked up and cleaned up and when that does go online uh, we'll do public out we've done public outreach we'll but we'll start a land steward program there so we'll have people that will attend in that basin really good interest in that neighborhood i love that Okay, there's a question from uh, David Sundstrom. Do you have any contacts at the city of Hermosa Beach? Um, in 2014, our chapter uh, collaborated with Surf West Basin uh, um, MWD on a native plant demonstration garden at the Hermosa Beach Community Center. It looked great until the pandemic. 
and it appears that uh, the maintenance was dropped. Um, so do you have any comments on that? Others, if people are not talking, please mute yourself. Somebody, Rose Robinson, uh, that stuff is unmuted. Yeah. Do you have any comments on, do uh, you know anyone at Hermosa Beach? No, David David, and David, I don't, oh, sorry. I don't know anybody over in Hermosa Beach. Um, uh, I do know the area you're talking about, but um, that, I think that's a call to this city manager's office and, and, and chase that down. As, as a lot of, Hermosa Beach has a really tiny uh, recreation or public, public works program. They have very few staff. And so it would be worth it to have a call out and just that way the community, the community has more power than staff does. Okay. Um. So Adela asks, uh, is there an effort to put natives on the rest of the bluffs above the Torrance Beach shoreline bike path? Um, we don't own that property. Uh, it's owned by the uh, LA County Beaches and Harbors. And so they manage it. Um, I don't know if there's any, uh, anything on the works with them. We're working with them just to repair some fencing uh, that's uh, eroded. But uh, right now, I don't know what's going on there. Okay. And uh, Karen asks, uh, aren't there Western red, red buds on PV Boulevard now? Yes, there are. Um, that's, uh, that's been a very exciting to see. And, and uh, Western red, red buds are really important. As they're the first bloomers in the spring, they're really important for our first insects in, in spring. I've yeah. seen, uh, we have several in parks now, and they're doing very well. Good, good location. Okay. And then... Um, Barb Ayler uh, invited you uh, for, first of all, she said fabulous presentation, but she invited you to uh, visit the Lunata Bay Native Garden, which uh, our chapter has helped to support. Um, yeah, so love to. Have an invitation to go out there and, and anybody else who wants to go out there, um, it's, it's there and you can go and see it in Lunata Bay. Um, let's see. Um, Carol Norcross said the island oak is really beautiful. And too. I need to look that one up. I got to write that one down. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. That one is uh, Kirkus tomentella. Tomentella? It's a really nice uh, oak from the uh, islands. Evergreen oak. It's Where a beautiful is it? tree. Is it, is it available, Tony? It's, it's difficult to find, but um, I think Tree of Life Nursery might be growing it. Okay, terrific. I don't know why it's not more uh, available in nurseries because it is a, it's a really nice tree. You know, I, it, I have never even heard of it. <laughs> I'm learning stuff every day too. <laughs> <laughs> cool, thank you. I'll, I'll look for that one, absolutely. We started a nursery at the city yard and we've already gotten volunteers for the nursery to run the nursery. So I'm very excited about that. We even have an Eagle Scout uh, starting to build the shade structures. Very good. Uh, does anyone else in the audience have any questions? Unmute yourself now. Oh, there's island oak growing at Prisk Native Garden in Long Beach. Gosh, you know uh, what? That's like 700 yards from my house. I'll go uh, look. <laughs> yeah, and um, probably um, Mike could grow you. You know Mike, right? Yes, uh-huh. Yeah, probably Mike could grow you some. So. All right, uh, here's a long question. Oh, nice. Okay, so uh, Kathy reminds us that um, uh, gardening is uh, something to promote well-being. Um, it's an uh, alternative to, um, to yoga. It, uh, weeding promotes stretching and balance, uh, lifting weights. Um, you lift filled trash cans. Just all, anytime you work out in the yard, uh, all the while enjoying um, weather, birds and nature, um, she agrees that volunteers are eager to contribute. So yeah, I think, you know, promoting the health benefits of gardening and, and the adopt a uh, park, um, I mean, the health benefits of parks um, and just being out in nature, um, there's a book, which I'm blocking the name of, but um, he talks, it was the uh, Palos Verdes Peninsula Library District Book of the Year that everybody read about five years ago, maybe. And um, 
like the last child in nature or something like that. Anyway. Last child in the woods, uh, Richard Louvre. Yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. And so he talks about all the studies that show decreased blood pressure, uh, anxiety, um, you know, people getting off medications, all that stuff. So there's a lot of um, potential health benefits uh, to uh, adopting a park and, and things like that. All right. So uh, Rosalie says uh, California Catalina ironwood has been used as a street tree in Northern California, I believe. Mm, nice. Um, Beautiful tree. Um, yes, and Gordon adds to my comment that community is good for mental health and longevity. Uh, I couldn't agree more. Um, all right. Um, so David, he's David. agreeing with Kathy. Um, all right. Hey, David. Um, yes, sir. But, um, Catalina Ironwood, we have one in our front yard and it mm -hmm. actually flowered, is flowering right now and flowered this year. We'd never oh, awesome. seen it. It's, it's wow. huge. The things are like, what, probably eight inches in diameter you, across. Really? And, Mail me yeah. a picture of a flower. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. We'd never seen it before. Yeah. I never seen it either. Well, maybe you get some seeds. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you do those, the flower head is gigantic on the thing. And if each one of those little flowers in there makes a seed or two, I mean, there'd be a lot of seeds, I guess. That's cool. Yeah. Well, Tony, are you familiar large, with that? We have a large one at, uh, at Madrona uh, in the garden. It flowers every year. Beautiful big sprays of white flowers. <clears throat> oh my gosh. Never had any, never had any volunteers. I never saw any seeds. I don't know if it needs cross pollination or maybe um, a clone that maybe does not produce seeds, but they're w widely available from the native nurseries and great uh, street tree too. Okay, cool. Thank you. I'll make that recommendation to our street tree guy. Well, it's a, a very good dialogue uh, tonight. As, as usual, after our meetings, we often, that's when the best uh, work gets done. Um, so, um, anybody else have anything to add? Thank you so much, Tracy, for um, Welcome, David. joining us. And uh, you always are a wealth of information and you present it in a very um, engaging manner. Uh, but truly, truly, um, I appreciate uh, on a personal level and an institutional level, all the contributions you've made to our uh, area, to conservation and native plants in our area. So we're grateful that you took the opportunity to come to be with us. So thank you, everybody, and uh, we'll see you next month. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for being out there. Keep up the good work. Together, we're making a difference. All right. Take care, Tracy, and I hope your, um, your body heals soon. It will. Good night. All right, take care, bye-bye. Thank you.